Okay, good morning. This is a, a new version, a new uh, version of the seminars at the Instituto de Astrofisica de Andalucía. Today, we will have the talk by Dr. Silvia Bonoli on behalf of the GPAS collaboration, and she will talk about GPAS, the universe in 56 color. And John will introduce her properly. Okay, hello to, to everybody. Isabel, our scientific director of the Severo Choa IAA program, cannot be to here today. Then I will have the pleasure to introduce our speaker, Silvia Monoli. Silvia obtained her PhD degree from the Max Planck Institute for Astrophysics in Munich. She, was, uh, she moved then for a postdoc to the University of Zurich and later at the Stanford University before joining the Centro, El Centro de Estudios de the Physical Cosmos de Aragón in, in, in Spain and Teruel. In El Cezca, she was first a, a fellow for two years and then staff researcher. And in, in 2018, she moved to San Sebastián as an Iker Basque Research Fellow. Her formation is primarily on simulations and models of galaxy formation, with a special focus on the formation and evolution of supermassive black holes. When she moved to Cezca, she started also being interested in observations, and with the time she got deeply involved in JPAS, where she will be uh, she will be talking about today. Since 2018, she is one of the two science directors of JPAS, and she is particularly interested in what JPAS can tell us about the active galaxies and high redshift quasars. On the theoretical side, she works on aspects related to the formation and evolution of black holes and the formation of galactic bars and bulges. She is part also of the Committee of Mujer y Astronomía of the Spanish Astronomical Society. And as, she's, and she's, as she says, she happily collaborates on projects to promote, to promote excuse me, the role of women and mothers in science. <laughs> we have today a very timely seminar where we will have a presentation of the first scientific results with mini JPAS and especially the first light, uh, the first light of JPCAM. It is a great opportunity for us to congratulate all the, JPCAM, all the JPCAM scientific and technical team for the extraordinary success. The camera is just now in the process of commissioning, but we are sure that plenty of results will come in the next years. Now I give you the floor, Silvia, to start with your talk. Thanks, thanks for participating in the program. Thanks a lot, Anchon, and uh, well, thanks the all uh, IAA for the for this invitation. Uh, I have to say I'm just a little disappointed that I cannot be there personally. Uh, I've been uh, meaning to come to Granada for a long time, so hopefully it will be possible, not too far in the future. So, yeah, so the, as Anton already said, today I will tell you about the JPAS survey. And, uh, you know, I'm particularly happy to talk about this with, uh, with you, with the IAA, given the IAA is one of the funding institutions of the survey. Uh, so I will say it more times in a, along the talks, but we welcome really all, uh, uh, all interested uh, IAA members uh, to approach uh, JPAS if they want to collaborate on any aspect of the survey. Okay, so, well, uh, before getting into the survey, I uh, uh, want to step back and uh, give a, some motivation of uh, why we really run these uh, large cosmological surveys. You have all seen these pictures possibly many, many times, uh, which is sort of seems like a simple plot, but actually encodes a huge amount of information that as a community we built in the last, uh, the last uh, few decades. So now we have a pretty much standard uh, understanding, a basic understanding of our universe was formed and evolved, which is pretty solid. This is Lambda CDM uh, uh, model for, for our universe. Uh, the big, everything started with the Big Bang. Uh, during inflation, uh, small um, uh, fluctuation in the density field were amplified to the cosmological scale and, uh, and they gave rise to what are the seeds of, uh, of gravitational structures of, of the collapse where, where structures could start uh, uh, form and, and evolve. 
first stars started to appear in these uh, first uh, mini halos. And then you know, the first galaxies came to be with all the then complicated uh, uh, nonlinear processes that came, uh, that took place afterwards and gave rise to this beautiful universe we have around us with a huge variety of galaxies and structure of different kinds. So this understanding of this global picture on the, on the large scale of how the universe form and evolve is pretty well now solid. So if we start, uh, if we put in a computer, our, this basic understanding, so this Lambda CDM, this cold dark matter uh, scenario with a, a cosmological constant, this uh, uh, Lambda, and uh, we assume that uh, the main uh, force, uh, the, the, the gravity is described by the general relativity. We take the cosmic microwave background as initial condition and we get this computer run, uh, run and, and predict what, how the evolution of structure take place. We come up with uh, uh, you know, uh, a universe that really resembles on the large scale is what we see. This is uh, the famous millennium simulation. This is just dark matter. So we see all this network, this uh, net of, uh, dark, uh, of, uh, uh, of matter, dark matter, uh, clusters of dark matter, con big halos connected through these filaments. And if one paints on top of these halos in a simple way, let's say, relatively simple way, uh, galaxies, so if one assumes there is a relation between dark matter halos and galaxy population, one can, come, uh, can derive what is a distribution of the observed uh, matter of the universe, observable matter, galaxies, that pretty much resembles what is observed. This is also a, a quite a bit old plots, but it shows this very well. Uh, on the top here, I guess you can see my, my, uh, my cursor, you see the Sloan Digital Sky Service back at the time, CFA, uh, CFA the uh, Great Wall, uh, to the F and how a similar structures can be found in simulation. In the last uh, you know, couple of decades, th things um, in terms of computing and in terms of a theoretical understanding of it improved significantly. And now not only the large scale structure, but even the small scale physics of galaxies seems to be, uh, be better and better understood. So if you run a full simulation where you also include like the, how baryons evolve, how stars are formed, what are the processes of complicated processes of feedback, you end up with galaxies that pretty much really resemble the real galaxies we observe. These are images of some blue and, and red galaxies from the most recent uh, TNG simulation, uh, uh, hydrodynamical cosmological simulation. Um, so really, it seems like, you know, our global understanding of the universe is pretty solid. So we can go from, you know, some initial condition from the CMB, get down to really small scale, uh, predict how galaxies can form and evolve. But there are still some basic questions that we cannot do. We don't know how to answer. What is actually the nature of this cosmic accelerator? What is lambda? Are there any modification to general relativity? And we still don't know what, what dark matter is. On top of it, there are many details about the small scale physics of galaxy formation that are actually quite important, not only to understand just galaxies, how they form and evolve, but also how galaxies affect the small scale uh, evolution of dark matter. Now we know that in the, at the center of the gravitational well, where, where uh, the center of halos, baryonic effects, process, feedback processes can actually uh, have, a, have a strong role in, in changing, in reshaping dark matter. Those, those uh, therefore, like a, a full understanding also how galaxies, how the small pro processes, the details of galaxy formation are also essential to have a global uh, understanding of, of galaxy, of structure formation in general. So because of this, this is driven now by now um, tens of, of large surveys, starting from, uh, uh, you know, SDSS, Wiggle Z, uh, which, uh, which took place, you know, uh, decade ago or so. And then, you know, now we have uh, the Dark Energy Survey that recently, I think, almost completed, Pan Stars, Cypher Supreme come ongoing. And then, you know, going to the future, to the future, uh, you know, Euclid, LSST, there is this large variety of surveys whose goal is really getting to what it's called the precision cosmology, try to really understand the details of, of our cosmological uh, understanding of, uh, of our understanding of how the, the universe uh, forms and evolves. Generally speaking, all these uh, surveys can be divided into two big categories, photometric surveys and spectroscopic surveys. 
in photometry, you just take pictures of parts of the sky and you, you, know, you have a, a, an image where you have all these different kinds of objects down to whatever magnitude you can, uh, uh, you can observe, the flux that you can observe depending on, on, obviously on the telescope size and your system. And generally this method is uh, faster and cheaper in the sense that in one go you can get a lot of objects and it's also unbiased. You have this uh, large uh, number of objects uh, um, and you know, you, whatever, everything that is within your pictures you have. So you can have all kinds of galaxies, all kinds of objects, right? On the other side, however, uh, you know, you, you, in photometry you don't have really a full, uh, you just have a few pictures. At best you have it in a few bands. So you can say, you know, approximately what's the color of galaxies and so on, but you don't have really the spectral information, the details of, of what these objects are. And that's why you, uh, many projects actually prefer to go with spectroscopy. So spectroscopy, take a specter of your objects, so you have full detailed information and you can get ex ex uh, precise information about the nature of the object and it's in particular for cosmological studies, the precise redshift information. Uh, so these are generally two different approaches. Obviously spectroscopy requires some photometric uh, uh, first uh, observation to target what, which objects you want to follow up spectroscopically. Uh, so it's very, you know, it's very expensive, not only the instrument, the spectroscopic instrument itself, but also because it requires this first, uh, uh, this first step. And also this first step uh, implies that there is some bias that in spectroscopic, uh, for, in spectroscopic service, you're always biased based on the kinds of cuts, the kinds of objects you have targeted, you have selected. Both approaches have, have been extremely successful depending on the type, on the type also of cosmological experiment you want to do. You prefer one over the other. Here below I am showing, uh, you know, some uh, weak lensing map from, uh, from DS science verification data already a few years old. Here you see a nice image of a cluster and then you can derive what is uh, through the lensing uh, of, uh, of galaxy or background galaxies due to the cluster in front. You can um, do a map of how dark matter is uh, distributed within this field. On the right, you see this one of the first measurements of the baryonic acoustic oscillation, which is this famous standard ruler, our way to measure, um, uh, to measure the size, uh, the size uh, of the universe. Um, uh, through uh, this one is one of the first measurements uh, from uh, the LRGs uh, from, uh, from Zone uh, already 15 years ago. And you know, the, uh, all these surveys are trying to improve on all these different experiments to try to reduce more and more the error bar and get more precise measurements. Uh, a technique which is in between, it's uh, what we call spectrophotometry. So effectively you're taking uh, images of, of the objects with so many bands that you effectively have an low resolution spectra. And already many experiments have already tried this, you know, have already done many great, there are already many great results based on this approach, from starting from Combo 17, to Shard, Cosmos, Alhambra, which, uh, which was driven by, by, by the IAA, and then the more recently also the PAU survey. So these are our own surveys in which uh, uh, you know, they are observing the sky with, um, with many bands, either narrow, small bands or medium bands, uh, but with so many bands that you can have almost uh, 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 you know, an approximate SCD of the, of the galaxy, that, of all the objects that you're observing. But typically they've been quite limited in the area, right? They were typically just pencil beam, except for PAU, all the others experiments were quite deep, but a focus on a small area. Effectively, also technically, it was not really possible to do, uh, to do large areas because it's quite time consuming. This, you have to reobserve the same areas of the sky with many different filters. So you take a filter, you observe the sky, take another filter, you observe the sky. So it's quite time consuming. So in order for that to happen, you need to have the old, a full technical system that allows it. And that's where JPAS enters. So JPAS, it wants to try to push this. Now we have, as I will show you, the, the, the technical capability. It has built uh, an instrument that can do that. Um, and JPAS, so, uh, it's a multi-band. So it has this idea of a spectrophotometry. So you take images in so many bands that you have a low resolution spectra, and I'll come back to that. It's a wide survey of the northern sky. It's a, it's a Primarily, it's a large collaboration of more than 100 people, primarily uh, from Spain and Brazil, although we have also members from other, from other places. 
Um, it's a joint, so the, the funding members were CEFCA, Interwell, the IAA, um, and then from Brazil, Observatorio Nacional in Rio de Janeiro, and uh, the University, the IAG, the University of Sao Paulo. Um, and uh, well, I will start describing the filter system, which is really the strength of JPAS. So the uh, the, ba the, um, the basic, uh, 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 let's say, the, 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 the defined filter system of JPAS consists of 54 narrow bands, which span the whole optical spectra, overlapping. So between a filter, the, uh, um, the, the middle of uh, each filter and the next one, there are 100 angstrom. And uh, complemented, these 54 narrow bands complemented by two uh, filters of medium and broadband on the, on the blue and the red wings of, uh, of the optical uh, uh, wavelength range. Um, so effectively, when you observe the sky with all this filter, you obtain a pseudo spectrum with a resolution of approximately 60, not only for every object, but also for every pixel of the sky you observe. So if you're interested, for example, in diffuse light or uh, intergalactic, uh, intracluster light, uh, you can take all this information uh, using the images of the dark, what is in the dark between objects by uh, having this information in all the different bands. Uh, so JPAS is, will be run uh, at the OIJ Observatory, the new observatory at the Sierra de Cavalambre, uh, uh, you know, about five hours from Granada. Um, it's a particularly dark uh, site for being uh, in continental Spain. Um, it has been tested uh, in a paper from Mariano Moles of 2010 to have a median seeing of about 0.7 R second and a large fraction of the time below one R second. Uh, it consists of two main telescopes. So the, the primary telescope is the uh, uh, Havalambre Survey Telescope, is a 2.5 meter, which also will be devoted uh, to, uh, so it's primarily devoted to JPAS, but will also carry out observation in the G-band for, for Euclid. And then a secondary telescope, the Javalambre Auxiliary Survey Telescope, which is a, a 80 centimeter, which is devoted to J+, and I will come to this in a, in a second. The Royal Observatories is uh, uh, ICTS since 2014, and also which means that uh, when 20% uh, of the time is open for open time, and, J and the small telescope, 80 centimeter, that has been uh, fully operating since a few years now, it's been also offering 20% of the time to the community. And here a special thanks to Mariano, a member of IAA, who has been pushing this, pro this project and this, uh, the construction of this observatory. Um, for, for many years until the, the success. So just one slide about J+. Unfortunately, I cannot say, uh, I don't have time to go in details on this, but you know, um, you can contact uh, responsible people, contact people, look at the website. So the PI is Javier Senarro, current director of CEFCA, um, and the PI Carlos Hernandez Montagudo and the scientific coordinator Carlos Lopez San Juan. So contact them if you have an interest in the, in the survey as well. So this is a small telescope, an 80 centimeter telescope, but it has an extremely large field of view of two, two degrees, two square degrees, and it's observing the sky with 12 filters. Now it's been a few years that it's observing the sky. Uh, first the data release of about a thousand square degrees was already um, made public. Uh, I forgot exactly, I think about uh, two years ago. And then uh, a second data release of with 2000 square degrees will be publicly available very soon. So if you are, there are already many scientific uh, results on this survey, so if you're interested, uh, look it up. So um, let's go back to JPAS, so the main telescope, the 2.5 meter telescope. This is an image of, uh, uh, of the size of the final instruments. On the left is JPCAM, and I will come back to this also in a moment. Um, and so this is a, a 4.5 square degree camera uh, composed of 14 CCD and how it compares the size of the camera with the moon, right? So it's, uh, it's uh, you know, it's, uh, it's huge. You have in a, in a full field of view, you have a really a big, you can observe a large part of, of the sky. Um, and on the right, you have Tieticam, the one that is running in plus, which is also big uh, as, as two square degrees. Uh, this is the uh, nominal footprint of JPAS. So uh, JPAS wants to observe the all uh, nor accessible northern sky cosmological fields, so not on the, on the galact outside of, the of the, our Milky Way, outside of the galactic plane. Um, 
um, and uh, this is a bit more uh, more technical. So it's a, a similar to the footprint of Sloan, except a bit more north because the telescope is located more north than uh, where Sloan is. Um, all the data processing and storage is is uh, is uh, taken uh, care of by CEFTA, uh, and uh, you know JFAS will produce a lot of data, about a terabyte of uh, of data for every night, and there is a complicated system of uh, transferring data through antennas down to from the observatory to the well where the data is processed and archived. So what what is the main goal of of JPAS? So it um, uh, JPAS has the um, will have the unique uh, uh, capability of carrying out different cosmological experiments uh, thanks to the uh, flexibility of its data. So you have uh, both you have both the power of imaging, but at the same time also the power of having precise information about the redshift of the sources thanks to the many filter information. Um, and, and, this, and, and this combination of different approaches is where the, where, what's the strength of JPAS. On the clustering side, uh, side it has been shown by, by Ticho Benitez in our... Uh, more than, okay. uh, more, than a, more than 10 years ago. Sí, but, uh, sorry, I don't know if someone is asking something. Uh, I keep going, okay? You just block me if I should stop. Um, so uh, you show that uh, with all these narrow bands, you can really get photometric redshift accuracy of objects with the, with the accuracy that you need to perform, uh, uh, to measure the baryonic acoustic oscillation, uh, the, uh, the BAO scale, but also uh, you know, the clustering in general of, 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 of different kinds of galaxies, both blue and red galaxies. And we expect at the end of the survey to have about 90 million galaxies up to about redshift one, with very, very, uh, very, very good redshift precision. But not only if we move to the higher redshift universe above redshift two, also with this narrow band, you can detect, I will show you later very well, also quasars and Lyman alpha emitters. About quasars, we, have, um, uh, we are working together with the WEAVE team, particularly the WEAVE QSO team. Uh, uh, they will follow up uh, alpha million quasars uh, of JPAS above redshift 2.2 to improve uh, the measurements of uh, cosmological parameters and um, uh, at the level and improving also over DESI. Um, for those of you who know, who have heard about the, the other survey DESI, so it's, which is one of the, the main survey, which is also about to start to, to measure uh, clustering of, uh, of objects. Um, so we'll, uh, we'll, we'll be able to do, to, uh, to, thanks to Wikio, so we'll also be able to uh, improve on cosmological parameter estimation above redshift 2, in redshift 2 and, and redshift 3. Also cosmological experiment, these are some uh, uh, results from uh, some forecast from Begonia Scasso, that was a PhD student there at the IAA. Um, where she was showing that thanks to the high uh, Rashi precision, actually JPAS is almost comparable to LSST and much better than uh, Dark Energy Survey in terms of the, uh, detecting and classifying clusters. So uh, we expect to have at the end of the survey hundreds of thousands of clusters uh, down to really the group size, not really cluster, even we're talking about almost groups, so a few times of 10 to the 13 solar masses. And this, it's interesting then uh, to combine with, an, uh, with other experiments. Here we have uh, some, uh, we have uh, uh, MOU with the German side of Erosita to combine optical and X-ray data for cluster science, um, but also you know, with our lensing or other or, of the lensing results also from overlapping survey to also um, com uh, combine on these different mass estimates to do cosmology with clusters. To the, uh, uh, final, uh, finally, about the, the other cosmology experiment, uh, in terms of lensing also, you know, we prioritize broad, uh, some broadband filters will also be used. Um, and in particular, I want to emphasize the, 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 the role of, again, the accurate redshift precision of JPAS for estimating uh, the redshift both of uh, lenses and also background galaxies, which is one of the key things of, of lensing studies. Also in the initial idea of JPAS, we also expected to measure, to detect a type 1a supernova uh, you, uh, with a specific cadence of observation. It's not clear whether this actually will be possible, most likely not, 
but still for non-supernova or supernova that are discovered along in, uh, in, uh, in other ways, um, you know, what, what JPAS can offer is actually precise redshift information about the galaxies hosting the supernova and also the environment to see if there is any effect on the, on the properties of supernova due to environment or the properties of the host galaxy. Uh, but, you know, despite being driven primarily by cosmology, JPAS is a very versatile survey. So in terms of galaxy evolution, there are a lot of, a lot of different kinds of studies that can be done. With all these diff all statistic no unbiased observations, you can study all different kinds of galaxies, um, detect the strong spectral features thanks to the narrow bands, and also in the, in the local universe, you can almost study galaxy, like a nearby galaxy, uh, you can study the spatial variation of their properties, and I will show an example of that later. In terms of galactic science also, um, detect uh, dwarf galaxies around the Milky Way in the north, so pushing the limits of what Sloan has done so far in the northern hemisphere, but other things like Tadeo stream, a metal poor star for galactic archaeology, these are interesting science cases uh, uh, where JPAS can contribute significantly. So let's uh, moment take a moment to, to talk about the status of JPAS. Um, uh, so we had some delays also due to the, the, the pandemia as well. So the camera, the final camera, JPCAM, is a, a, a very large, it's actually I think the second largest camera uh, now in the world. Um, it's a 1.2 gigapixel camera, it's composed of 14 CCDs uh, with a resolution of 0.23 r second per pixel and I was telling you before as this, the, its strength is this very large field of view of 4.5 square degrees. It was installed at the telescope in February 2020, that's when it was first in the telescope, and a big thanks here to all the uh, engineering team, they did a great work uh, under the uh, leading role of Tony Marin. Um, uh, however, because you know, the pandemic hit hard there as well, uh, operation had to stop. And the first light happened at what happened after uh, wars could uh, resume, but we had this fi finally this great news of the first light of the camera, technical first light, at the end of June. This is a nice image of, uh, this is what, uh, more advertising image, more for the public, a nice image of the Andromeda galaxy, you see, you know, in the old field of view of, of the camera, you see the entire galaxy uh, taken during this first night of uh, technical first light. Um, this is a more, let's say, technical, uh, work-oriented um, um, image. Another field where you see, you know, uh, enormous amount of objects. Uh, take it, these are 30 seconds in the G filter. This is just raw data. And from a first analysis of that night, of the date of that night, um, you know, the camera right away showed a very good performance in terms of homogeneity along the, the field of view, along the uh, focal plane. Um, that night the seeing was excellent, was about 0 0.6, 0 0.7 r second, and the PSF of the, uh, that was uh, along the, of the camera, along the, the entire focal plane, was about uh, 0 0.8, 0 0.88 uh, uh, r second, uh, with an homogeneity within uh, 10%. So this is great, uh, and, and the, the camera now, you know, we were all happy with this first light, and as Sanchon was mentioning before, it was a great achievement for the, for the whole team. And now the commissioning has started, the technical commissioning, and we hope that the, the survey will start in, in a few months. So um, now, um, let me see, I have uh, still uh, 15 minutes. So um, before JPCAM was installed, uh, and in the telescope, uh, there was another camera that we called the Pathfinder, which was essentially equivalent to one CCD of the, uh, of the final camera, with, located at the center of the focal plane, a much smaller field of view in total, of about uh, um, 0.3 square degrees. And we took advantage of this instrument to carry out a small survey, which we dubbed uh, Mini J Pass. Um, we actually did also um, other, uh, we targeted also other pointings, but yeah, most of the, most of the, uh, of the focus was on, the, of, on a specific field, which we dubbed uh, mini j -pass. On the Aegis field, so um, some of you that might be familiar with the, with the different famous fields um, on the northern sky, um, this is the extended growth strip, this uh, green strip. And along these, uh, there are many different uh, multi-wavelength data along this uh, strip. 
and that's what where we observe. So with four pointings of the of uh, of this Pathfinder camera, we were covering the almost the entire uh, this entire field. Um, obviously, it took a lot of time because you know you had to observe these four pointings with all the 56 uh, filters. So you know, we were observing and then again and then again. And it took time and also technically it was not obvious, it was not trivial to you know, complete all this observation while this field was observable uh, on the sky. But you know, with also great effort uh, from the OIJ um, of, um, uh, technical team, this was possible and in 2018 all the observations were completed. This on the left, and now you see how the field looks like with the, with the data. This is a combination of actually broadband data. And uh, with the zoom in some areas where you see some nice, uh, uh, some nice galaxies. Um, so the data was actually re publicly released at the end of last year. And uh, it's all available in a data portal. You can just go and, and you know, navigate through the data. Or, uh, or download all the catalogs that you're interested in. Um, you know, you can dive in and actually, you know, try to zoom in different objects and get all the information. For example, get what are what are the um, in this case the magnitude and the, the, the let's say pseudo spectra, what we call it, or how we call it now, J spectra, the J spectra of uh, of all the individual of all the objects that are detected. And you know you can get all the different information, including an estimate of the of the redshift, the photometric redshift, whether it's a compact or an extended sources, and so on. So we took advantage of this data to actually test the potential of JPAS, the scientific potential of JPAS, but also the quality, obviously, of the data that we can get from the telescope. So um, in total, uh, so this was a paper that came out uh, in July, which which where we summarize all these results. Um, in total, it's one square degree, 0.9 square degree after uh, masking, taking away uh, bright stars and, and other artifacts. In total, we have 65,000 objects that were detected in our band, in the, in the broadband, and 600,000 objects that are detected in individual bands. So you can have some objects, maybe extreme emitters, that only show up in a few narrow bands, but not in all the other bands. Uh, we estimate the completeness to be at magnitude 23.6 for point sources and 22.7 for extended sources. And we reached and surpass what is the magnitude limit expected for JPAS. Um, the, this is the full width of maximum. So what is the, the image quality? It's always between uh, uh, 1 and 1.5 are second for the narrow bands. And the broadband, uh, we, we were observing not only with the j, uh, j -pass filter system, but also with broadbands, so, uh, GR and I, it's always below uh, one R second. So this is the number density of sources that we have in this square degree. Um, uh, you know, point like sources, stars and quasars included there, uh, go uh, are hundreds of sources in the square degree. Galaxies, we reach the tens of thousands of galaxies uh, within this, this, um, this, um, within this, uh, the mini JPAS field. Uh, uh, compact and extended sources have been classified with different methods. Uh, um, the, the, the default is the star galaxy separation based on uh, Lopez San Juan 2019. Uh, which was also a technique uh, used, uh, it's a Bayesian uh, um, um, star galaxy classif classificator, uh, which was also used, developed and originally used for J+. But we also have uh, um, a neural network classifier um, that was recently published by Bucky, uh, uh, by Bucky and, collabor and, uh, the, and the collaboration. So here, really, let's get to the, the nice part. Um, uh, so what can JPAS see? So in the, in the, you have both the images, the image of individual objects, of the objects, and the full spectra, or, or this, this uh, J spectra. Compare the, so here are the, so the images, in this case, are stars. There are six stars, different kinds of stars, from blue to red stars. Um, and in color, you see the different points of the, uh, the flux measured in the different narrow bands. And in gray is the spectra of, of Sloan on the same, of the same objects. So you can see the most, the, the, the most prominent absorption lines are, are well traced by the, by the narrow bands. 
The same if we go to extragalactic sources. Here we have an examples of galaxies in quasar. The first four are galaxies. There is an emission line galaxies uh, um, with a, a strong H alpha emission here. Uh, red galaxies with the famous Horthausen Angstrom break, another higher redshift galaxy, another red galaxy, this one at redshift point 0.3. And then the last two objects are quasars. And also you can see quasars because of their broad emission lines are particularly uh, good to be, uh, to be selected and characterized with JPAS. You can characterize not only the, um, you know, their nature as quasars by looking at, uh, you know, finding their emission lines, but also you can estimate with extreme accuracy uh, the redshift and uh, also the, the we, we hope to be able also to estimate uh, quite precisely the equivalent width and flux of individual uh, emission lines. So some uh, scientific results, there are many papers in preparation um, uh, from also many people at the IAA, the galaxy evolution here, I'm showing first some example of galaxies. Uh, the galaxy evolution group is led by Rosa, uh, Rosa Gonzalez Delgado, and also Ariana Cortez from Brazil, from the Brazil side. Um, so there are many people there uh, working on this with Rosa, Ines Martinez Solaeche, Luis Garcia, many, uh, many people there that you can talk to if you're interested in this. So um, uh, on the top here, you see a nearby galaxy where you see the, um, you know, the, the, you see the spectra, let's say the, uh, the spectra in gray, the photospectra in, uh, in black, and then in red, what is the fitting. Um, uh, the spectra here is coming from manga, which is, uh, you know, specifically a few uh, uh, um, survey to study the spatial variation of the, the 2D uh, variation of the properties of, uh, of nearby galaxy. And here we show uh, the, the field of view of manga is the hexagon there. You see here the, this red hexagon. And the, the power of J-Pass is even if we, you know, we have lower spectral resolution than, than manga, what we can contribute is having this very wide field of view. So we can extend the analysis much to several effective radii from the center of the, of the, of the galaxy. And the, the derived stellar property, the properties of the stellar population that are derived, the ROSA is demonstrating that are actually almost, e almost equivalent than what you can derive from, from, from spectra. Um, below, we can see actually the, the morphological study of galaxy. We see a, a, a red galaxy on top here and a blue galaxy. How they appear different in the, in the, in the different bands. Um, you can have a, 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 like an extended star forming disk will show up uh, primarily in blue filters, whereas the red component of a galaxy will show up primarily in the, in the red filters. So you can do all this kind of analysis, combine all the different filters information to get more precise uh, information about the intrinsic, the morphology and the characteristic of the galaxies. This is another work in preparation by, by Rosa. Uh, and the whole uh, galaxy evolution team where they study the global, the, 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 uh, the properties of the whole galaxy population up to magnitude 22.5. This is the redshift distribution. It picks uh, of, the, of the selected objects, this uh, dark histogram, which picks approximately a redshift 0.35.4. And this is um, a different redshift, redshift beans. What is the color magnitude relation? Um, so you see, uh, you know, that you have blue galaxies down here, red galaxies up there. These two different rows uh, are done, is effect the same analysis, but done with two different methods, with two different um, um, SED fitting codes. And, uh, and you see, for example, here, the, the, the result is what you expect, that going from low redshift to high redshift, you have a large, at, uh, at higher redshift, you have a larger number, larger fraction of blue galaxies and a lower fraction of red and uh, old galaxies. Um, Hines um, has uh, already uh, submitted a paper in which uh, he, using JPAS mocks, he proves that uh, he can train um, uh, an artificial neural network to actually um, select, detect the equivalent width of emission lines and um, even get to uh, use line, uh, uh, line ratio diagnostic to classify galaxy. Mm -hmm. And he's actually currently, so he's he has already submitted a paper where he demonstrates with JPASMOC that that is possible to get a similar, um, to get a 
quite good estimates of the properties of, uh, of galaxies in this sense, and a paper in preparation for emitting line galaxy um, is ongoing. Uh, so let's get to the photometric redshift accuracy, again also for cosmological studies, going to actually what, was, what is one of the main uh, driver of JPAS. So this is for, this is uh, um, the uh, photometric versus spectroscopic redshift, classical plot, and you see that with the uh, density contours, most of the, like uh, the uh, vast majority of galaxies have extremely uh, good photometric redshift. Um, uh, effectively, the la uh, I forgot exactly now the fraction, but um, uh, up to a, a magnitude of about 22.5, you get that almost all galaxies have a um, photometric redshift precision below 1%. Um, so uh, what is the target? For cosmological studies, the redshift precision, which is um, uh, shown here with this uh, sigma and mag, is 0.3%, uh, which is reached um, uh, with uh, uh, down to magnitude 22.5 with 50% of the galaxy. With again, all galaxies effectively being below 1% of redshift precision. This is the redshift precision uh, as a function of magnitude for red and uh, blue galaxies. Uh, red galaxies overall tend to have a better redshift precision. Um, uh, uh, that depends less because of the 4,000 Angstrom break being very strong. But emission line galaxies also have a quite good performance and uh, they're more numerous. So that's also that gives a lot of uh, potential to do a lot of cosmology clustering studies with blue galaxies. So this is it, how the large scale structure is traced by, by JPAS galaxies. So um, this is a comparison of uh, um, the redshift estimated by DEEP2, which is a spectroscopic survey, compared with the results of photometric redshift from mini JPAS. So up to redshift 0.5 more or less, the, the uh, agreement is extremely good. At higher redshift, there is a bit more disagreement, but you can select the subsamples of galaxies that can give you the redshift precision that you need. We have a, um, you know, in this, uh, in this uh, world of photometric redshift uh, um, analysis, there are ways to tag uh, galaxies depending on the performance of the photometric redshift. So you can select subsamples that are uh, in increasingly better redshift precision. So this is uh, the deliver, uh, derived number density of galaxies, a function of redshift compared to the ones of some ongoing and past surveys. Um, so it's the here is divided for red and blue galaxy in the mini J pass and all galaxies is black with uh, uh, squares for all objects and blue and circles for objects in which these, they have high quality uh, photos, let's say. You get the ratio precision that you need for cosmological experiment. So we are in terms of number density, we have uh, much more sources than what uh, are experiments like uh, uh, low Z or CMAS, other zone experiment, and we are comparable in this intermediate redshift of 0.8, we are comparable to the number density that uh, Desi is expecting. Other objects we were mentioning before, clusters, how, um, and uh, so this is the biggest cluster that was found in the mini JPAS field. Uh, it's a very large cluster, but was uh, somehow not uh, well characterized in the literature. Uh, there are actually two, only two galaxies, central galaxies that have a spectroscopic redshift. All the other galaxies here you see in white, they are the redshift, these are the photometric redshift. So again, thanks to the high, uh, very high quality photometric redshift, we can very well estimate and the, uh, the, the membership of, of, of galaxy in those estimate uh, uh, cluster properties. And there is a paper ongoing in preparation with a cluster catalog on the mini JPAS field. Um, indeed, we also show uh, that we can get down much below 10 to the 14 solar masses as limiting uh, 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 cut for cluster mass. So JPAS really has the power to detect also groups. And here it's also another interesting work on preparation by Rodriguez Martin, Julio. So here you see the color, the intrinsic color of galaxies within this, in this cluster as a function of distance to the main, gal uh, to the main galaxy. So you see uh, closer galaxies are here in, in, in blue, and they are more red and uh, more red galaxies, whereas the galaxies further out, the one in red, are more on the blue sequence of, of, of galaxies. 
So, you know, you can imagine you can do all these interesting studies of actually studying color transformation of galaxies as they, as they, uh, depending on their distance to, to the center of a cluster. So I'm getting to the end. Uh, so just summarizing, uh, JPAS is a multiband uh, uh, survey. The, the, its strength is in uh, the uh, many narrow bands. Um, it will observe uh, uh, our target goal is, uh, is about 8,000 square degree of the northern sky, of the north extragalactic, let's call it, sky. The main instrument of the telescope of the T250 is JPCAM, which has been, uh, which saw first light a couple of months ago, less than two months ago, and is in phases of uh, technical commissioning, and we hope the survey will start by the end of the year. Thanks to this first uh, data set from uh, what we call the Pathfinder camera, an interim camera on the telescope, we collected a square degree of data with all the filters that uh, you know, was a great tool to start studying the, uh, the potential of JPAS and really get ready for the arrival of the, of the, of the, of the you know, big uh, JPAS data. And uh, with this, I finish repeating uh, again that you know, IAEA is one of the funding institutions of JPAS. So all of you interested in this, just uh, you know, contact any of us. Thank you. Okay, Sylvia, thanks a lot for your very nice talk. And I think it's, it's time again to congratulate all the technical and scientific team involved in JPAS for, the, for this great achievement. Like I think it's, it's now time for talks, uh, for questions, excuse me. And then those that are interested in posing a question, please raise your hand and then I, I, will, I, I will give you the floor. Who wants to start? Okay, Pepa. Thank you, Silvia, for your nice talk that gives really an excellent overview of the very exciting results coming out from the, the JPAS survey. I, I will take the opportunity to, to acknowledge also uh, the, the intellectual person that start to think in this uh, um, from the very beginning, and he got a disaster like Mariano. <laughs> but, uh, we we have the opportunity to have here and also to to uh, to be the PI of Alhambra. That was previous idea uh, behind JPAS. And I have too many questions, but I think that I will ask you in private because. It's many things about uh, technical aspect and, and all this thing, but I think that I am. Um, I have two or three questions that uh, that can be interested. It's uh, do you think that with J pass is enough uh, to to constrain redshift, or you need also some complementary data on near infrared? Or how this the new complementary data of near infrared can help to improve, or do you think that is enough? I think it highly depends on the kind of objects that you want to study. So, and the rest shift. So, I think it's mm -hmm. uh, from the results we got, it's certainly, you know, we find that the, the spectral resolution that you can achieve is good enough it's high enough that you can really get already very excellent redshift information based on that. Mm. Obviously, uh, near infrared information would add a lot, in particular for higher redshift galaxies. Yes, so, uh, I was thinking that, uh, that this, uh, this uh, project is perfect for searching for high redshift object and, and maybe near infrared can help us. Sorry, Pep, I cannot hear you very well. Can you repeat the last thing? That for high redshift, this, this kind of surveys are very good. If you try to search for high redshift uh, objects uh, and they add, adding near infrared, they can help uh, quite a lot. Yeah, 
So I think it depends on how high you mean high. So because of the magnitude limit of J-Pass, you know, it's different from the one of Alhambra. Alhambra was a sort of a pencil beam, was reaching almost two magnitude fainter. So, you know, I think with Alhambra, you could really push to above redshift one, right? Um, with J-Pass, I think um, because of the magnitude limit, I don't think you can go much beyond redshift one, 1 1.2 possibly. Um, then you can open up the old high redshift universe again, you open up the new window above redshift two, when you get the Lyman alpha inside the, um, the optical range. So then, you know, Lyman alpha emitters and, uh, and quasars uh, can be very easily detected. So, uh, you know, th there is in the redshift range between one and two, um, it's less obvious. I guess, as you say, if you complement with other data, possibly you can still select uh, some interesting sources for sure. And the other question is about uh, variability. You know that I am very much interested in, in quasars that are varying, changing uh, their aspect from type one to, to type two. So do you have any plans on variability on how can we accommodate using this? Yeah, so variability is a bit both of an interesting and a tricky thing. <laughs> so in particular, you know, if we don't observe with all the features on the same night, if there is a variable object, that might you know, create some problems, but they could partially be accounted for. If you're interested in changing objects, I think certainly there is a lot of room of work there by comparing with uh, with previous data, with archival data. Mm -hmm. I mean, if there are candidates, obviously the, you know, you can, we don't expect to observe the same fields multiple times, right? Most of our data will be single epoch. So mm -hmm. at least within a certain filter range. So you can, most likely by with JPass alone, you will not be able to get variable information. But what you could do certainly is you can estimate from JPass data whether, for example, a, a quasar is a type one or a type two, depending on the width of the line. And then you could compare it with uh, with archival data to see if there is a been a change in that. I don't know if this is what about a bit along the lines of what you could be interested in. I, I was thinking about this uh, um, because I thought previously in Alhambra that maybe the the world uh, seen night still can work for for compact objects. Also, you can take the advantage of observation in night of four seen and make a comparison with the night with the good seen. And then maybe you can you you can look for candidates or, or yeah, actually in in this respect uh, there is already a project that is being run on uh, with a small telescope, uh, with eighty centimeters telescope. There is a problem <coughs> of variability called the JVAR, which is mm -hmm. primarily run by Alessandro de Rocchipe, I think, and, and Hector Vasquez. I think Hector may be here connected. So, um, so taking advantage of not photometric night to reobserve uh, periodically certain fields. I think that's approximately. So yeah. this may be also, you know, that's actually also a possibility eventually for for the big telescope as well. So to, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Spitan, any other question? Okay, since nobody is asking for the moment, let me ask you just a, a curiosity, a technical curiosity. How many, with how many filters can you, can you observe simultaneously? Man. So we observe, simul so the, the way it's set up, there are 14 CCDs on the camera and the way the system is set up, each on top of each CCD, there will be a different filter. Okay. But they're not observing the same part of the sky because yeah. um, because well they're next to each other right mm -hmm. so 
you could think of it actually as 14 surveys going on at the same time with the same with different filters and then you have to tile so that you know the same area then gets observed with all the 14 mm -hmm. and uh you know um it's uh what we say it's a bit like a jukebox so you have uh, uh, mm -hmm. all the 56 filters in four uh, trays so you can put a tray on top of the camera observe you can take it off remove it and put the next one and you observe again the same fields with uh, with the other uh with the other filters okay. and uh, we are currently in the process of finalizing the survey strategy to decide exactly how we want to do that yeah yeah okay And let me ask you also, uh, and I think about something that I think is very promising for the future. In fact, you, you have mentioned it here in your talk. These are the synergies with other surveys and instruments. No? You have mentioned explicitly agreements with, with Euclid with all with Erosita also i was thinking of course due to my background in synergies with ska and other radio yeah. surveys i think it's uh, in that sense is uh, it opens a, a new avenue also of work that it can be very positive in the next years yeah also with radio as you say that is a yeah. lot of interesting uh, potential for both for agn and uh, yeah especially yeah yeah Stuff. Mm -hmm. thanks any other questions from from the participants? I don't see any any hand here, but if somebody wants to uh, unmute, he can make a question. Okay, then I think uh, we're yeah, going to... If someone comes up with questions later, also again, feel free to contact uh, me or people at SEFCA or, you know, there, mm -hmm. Pepe. Pepe there is highly involved. Rosa is doing a lot of work with the Galaxy. Yeah. So, you know, just uh, contact if you have any question coming up later on. Very good. And also I want to remember all the assistants that uh, all the participants that that this talk will be available via the uh, YouTube after that. Okay, and then you can you can follow it quietly. Okay, thanks, Sylvia, again okay. for your very, very nice talk. It was very comprehensive and it gave a very good overview of, of the project. And, and also about the, the and the future avenues that will be coming from this great project. Thanks a lot. Yeah, very soon. Okay, thank okay. you. Thank you bye for bye. the invitation. Okay. Thanks a lot. Thanks to everybody for, for taking part. Bye, everyone. Bye. Mariano, ¿qué tal estás? Bien, es que no, no me he dado cuenta que estabas aquí. No sé quién lo ha mencionado, creo que Pepa. Sí, bien, bienvenido. Thank you to, to everybody. Okay. Bye. Hi, Mariano. Hi. Ciao, Silvia. Tutto bene? Tutto bene, grazie. <laughs> Thank you, Hinde. <laughs> Ciao. Okay. Ciao. Bye. Bye. Thanks a lot, Silvia. It Thank was you. very. I mean, Bye. I have a lot of curiosities about the observing mode, but we can Sorry? talk. I have a lot of curiosities about the observing mode, etc. As you mentioned, yes, the, yes, to optimize the observing mode is a very important part of the project also, I assume. Yeah, so right now we are sort of converging on um, two different layers of priority. Yeah. Um, well, not quite different, but so two different uh, strategy to, let's say, complement different uh, and um, make possible different projects mm -hmm. at the same time. So, to observe faster, uh, larger fractions of the sky with yeah. a subset of the filters, uh, both for you know clusters up to redshift 0.6 uh, and uh, uh, galaxies up to redshift uh, yeah 0.6.7. Yeah. Um, because the mapping also of the near of the local universe, uh, you know, it's what you know up to redshift 0 0.3, 0 0.4 is what JPAS can be extremely like. And also, yeah, all the clusters uh, around Rashi point five, and then uh, and that the same set of filters would allow you also to do quasars and Lyman alpha emitter at the very high Rashi universe. So 
So we'll try to complement the large areas with a subset of filter. Mm -hmm. and, uh, also, uh, still at the same time, granting a few, few hundred square degrees a year with all the filters. Mm -hmm. That we could also do, you know, galaxies at redshift uh, uh, 0.7 to 1, and also, you know, somehow filling the hole of what is missing there. Uh, but, you know, to make uh, all different kinds of science cases working together, I think mm -hmm. it's possible getting the most, um, it seems to be the best strategy. So, yeah, we are trying to finalize it and freeze it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Okay, good. Good luck then. Okay, yeah. Sylvia. Okay. Then Bye. see Bye. you soon. Bye-bye. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.